Welcome back, Pathless Peddlers, and uh, thank you for joining us for another episode of PLP Talks, where we have interesting conversations with interesting bike people. And if you're new to this series, you should check out our previous videos. We did an interview with uh, Jay Peterberry, Sarah Swallow, Kurt Snyder, and today's guest is just as interesting. It's going to be an awesome conversation today. We're going to be speaking with Nam and covering topics about bike packing and some topics that the bike industry is just terrible at talking about gender and race. So uh, let's welcome our special guest, Nam. Thanks for joining Woo! us. <laughs> the crowd goes wild. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, you've been traveling a lot, but right now you're uh, you're in sunny Tucson. It looks like. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's about like seventy degrees, and it's sunny. It's great. Oh, dang. In December, it's awesome. <laughs> we should Sorry. trade. We're in we're in Missoula, and it's uh, I think the temperature outside currently is like eighteen degrees. So it's oh, big difference. forget <laughs> that. Yeah. No um, thanks. Yeah. So for those that might not be familiar with you, can you t tell us a little bit about how you got into bike touring and bike packing? Um, so I mostly started uh, because I was gifted a, um, a touring setup by my partner. Um, and I've always kind of wanted to tour, but I didn't like the look of the extra cycle. You know, I think that's what in my head um, three years ago, I had in my head that that's what touring looked like because that's what people I knew who toured did and I was like that's really not for me it seems like too much stuff so I got gifted this red stump jumper and um the first tour that I went on was um like in November of 2014 or 15 um in Virginia and I was literally going like three miles an hour just like right. <laughs> with not even that heavy of a setup but you know I think back on it right now I'm like wow I was I was such a little noob still a noob but definitely going a little bit faster than three cool. not by much yeah <laughs> yeah so was it uh essentially love at first sight when you first tried touring or was there kind of a little transition period where you had to get into it that's a great question um i like i think i got a lot of emotions from that first tour <laughs> lots of feels it, it was yeah so many feels like you should see my journal it's like every day it's very it's very scattered and lots of emotions like conflicting ones too. Uh, it wasn't really love at first uh, ride or whatever you want to call it, it but it was definitely um, healing. It was, it was time I had to myself to think about stuff without any kind of like external judgment or feeling that like external judgment. It was just, just me, you know, out there. And I could do anything I wanted and not have to respond to a reaction someone else had, you know, whether right. it was like family or friends or even strangers. Um, and because I was traveling with my partner, I felt pretty safe and um, like nurtured in in all of these emotions that I was experiencing and and just the joy of it. So wasn't necessarily love but it was something that i <laughs> absolutely valued you know like i really i really uh changed <clears throat> how i have relationships with myself and um and the world so right that's pretty significant i yeah. think <laughs> i think that's, <laughs> that's the all we fucking have <laughs> yeah i think that's an interesting point like uh you know we'd interviewed uh, sarah swallow and uh, you know she kind of talked about the point that you know it looks good online and until you try it, you might not actually like it, although it looks awesome. So it might, you know, it's something that's definitely, uh, you know, best thing ever for some people, but for others, you know, it might not, you know, it not, might not be living the dream exactly. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, one of the cool things that you did recently was uh, you applied for the Blackburn Ranger program, got accepted. Can you tell us a little bit about that whole process and the trip that you guys did? Yeah. Um, so I applied because um, I was talking with my like sweetheart friend, Whitney, mm -hmm. uh, for Terry, and she was going to apply. And we were kind of talking like, should we apply? Should we? We decided to do it and kind of through the application process. So you have to make a video and do like a video plea and kind of mm -hmm. campaign for yourself in that way. Um, so during that campaign, uh, Whitney and I were scheming a little bit and we decided to um, make uh, make a call out to Blackburn to have all the Rangers be women mm -hmm. or trans femme, um, non-binary, like uh, just not dudes, right. uh, all of them. Cause that's never happened. We thought that would be really cool. Right. So in addition to our own campaigns to get selected as a Ranger, we were also, 
um, hoping to have that result. Right. Didn't happen this year, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> maybe it'll happen at some point. But I thought that that was really, really empowering mm -hmm. and awesome. And I think it engaged a lot of people and just kind of planted the the potential of what what that could be and what that could look like for the industry or like right. for ourselves um but yeah i did get selected and i selected switzerland because uh like it's it's like a fairyland filled with like <laughs> mystical creatures <laughs> playing the lute and like right. hopping down trees and stuff um so I wanted to go there also because there's like lots of Tibetans there. Um, I have a cousin there um, and politically it's been a really uh, like awful thing happening there and in lots of Europe for in terms of like uh, immigration policies mm -hmm. and like white nationalism kind of right. taking the helm. No surprise that it's in Europe. But um, so, yeah, the we ended up there. Um, the beginning, the first week of September, and it was like so cold. We went from, <laughs> we went from like high summer in Connecticut to, like straight up winter in Connecticut in like essentially two days. Oh dang! <laughs> and it was just like a really big shock. But I really wanted to finish the route. It was so so gorgeous. Like I've never seen anything like it before, in terms of like bike infrastructure. It was incredible. Like the entire trail which is like 75% unpaved, was marked. There was like oh, wow. little springs <laughs> in every town. Right. Yeah. And you are literally going through fairylands. Like, you know those Disney movies where there's like castles and like <laughs> little little provincial towns where people are like cobbling shoes or whatever they do right. in provincial towns? <laughs> that was happening, you know? And we had like, it was just like absolutely stunning. Cool. Um. And Blackburn gave me that opportunity. Like, I would have never been able to do that um, and experience that without, you know, their sweet bike and all the gear mm. and the travel stipend. Like, that really helps out when you're a poor person trying right. to take <laughs> on the world on a bicycle. Right, right. So is that... That's really cool. Yeah. So is that essentially, that's that's uh, the, the wrap-up of the Blackburn. Do you guys have any other future projects down the pipe or... Well, like? I, I'm going to go back to Switzerland in the, in the summer. Um, we're going to be going back to, uh, finish that route. I like, I'm really committed to finishing it. It was really tough. Yeah. Like the elevation profile was like this <laughs> and like up here is like 10 K and down here is like below 10, you know, yeah. it's, it was crazy. But, um, with, with these climbs, like you get the views. Right. You know, like it's, it's just amazing. So I, I'd really like to finish that. Um, not, not as a ranger, but definitely like as a post ranger, I don't know, the cool. black ranger. Yeah. Cool. So was that, that whole experience pretty, pretty positive, uh, going through the, the ranger program? I've always wondered, you know, I, I see their call out every year and I'm curious. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really amazing. Um, there's some really awesome folks in there. Um, Amanda, who I was in contact with the most during my trip is like this super solid person who, um, is a really strong rider and on top of it has like a really good head on her shoulders, kind person. And Robin is like, just like the sweetest person in the world. Yeah. Um, and then there was lots of other folks who, um, who are part of like on the Blackburn side who are just incredibly supportive and like um, pretty cool to hang around with. And then like there's the other Rangers who are also just really, really funny, good yeah. people to get drunk <laughs> with. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> really, really fun. Like Pablo, who's traveling around um, Spain with his dog Hippie, um, <laughs> was, was at like the camp, the pre-Ranger camp this year. And they're yeah. just like, the coolest so it was it was overall like super positive experience cool and i'd encourage everyone to apply for it yeah and yeah, we got a chance to <laughs> hang out with robin for a couple of days during the oregon ramble ride and uh that was pretty cool you know because i that was my first like interface with like the people behind the brand and they seem all really like laid back and chill and you know, yeah. yeah yeah super approachable i mean one of the first things that they told us was like the priorities for you and your adventure is just to have fun and 
other than that, we don't really have that many expectations. Like right. definitely send us pictures and journals, right. which is what I was doing anyway. Um, but like have fun. And so like two weeks into it when we were battling snow and cold and like, obviously I didn't prepare as well as I should have. Um, I was like, I'm not having any fun. Like right. it's not that <laughs> fun to be winter bike camping in the wild. So then we decided to go to Italy and it was a lot better there yeah. weather wise. <laughs> Yeah. So it was like kind of a choose your own adventure. Like they gave you, um, they gave you suggestions on what route to do. But at the end of the day, it felt really empowering because I got to make my own decisions about what bike packing and what like fun mm -hmm. bike touring could be. Right. <laughs> so I did that. I did a pick your own adventure. Thing. <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, so. I watched your uh, your Blackburn application video, and aside from like the biking aspect, <laughs> it sounds like you have like a real like activist background. Do you feel like um, you know doing something like the Ranger program, or you know having uh, a platform on social media gives you um, just a place to to talk about other issues that that are important to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I've been I've been uh, like active politically for a while um i'm a tibetan person so like naturally you're born with like a <laughs> megaphone in your hand and a banner in your heart like um so uh, growing up like going to up tibetan national uprising day uh marches like our slogan is if someone is oppressed then no one is free mm -hmm. um so and then like mix that with um like buddhist teachings of empathy and compassion um and so you you've you've like created this this um culturally uh an activist because mm -hmm. like right. there's unfairness kind of everywhere and I'm also a Libra, so like I see unfairness, and I'm like, "Ooh, that's not cool. That's yeah. not cool. We have to change that." Yeah. Um, so, I think social media is um, has been helpful in some ways, and then not in other ways. I think it's really good to broadcast a message, but I'm not sure how effective it is as um, as like uh, action. You know, I think it's really good to. To wake people up to something or give someone something that they haven't necessarily thought about but in terms of like the work the actual work um i'm not sure how effective it is um but it's definitely a good tool right. you know it's it's definitely a good tool i remember early in like activist days people would be like oh yeah i only have facebook to organize right. and it's like no you don't you have it to stock on your exes and the same shit that we all do yeah. You know, so it's like it just like has evolved in in like leaps and bounds. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been pretty cool. Um, I try to be as as real as I can be, you know, like when I put politicized uh, you know, reactions out there, it's it's because like it impacted me for days and I was probably crying or like laughing maniacally or something uh, for days. And like it just eats you up inside. So I have to. I have to put it out there because it's it's actually like me being real to myself. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I've always pondered that because it, it seems like you know social media offers you uh, not just you specifically, but offers people like you know this this great reach. But uh, in some ways, people just kind of consume it for you know bread and circuses, right? For entertainment, and yeah. not so much about some hard hitting stuff. Um, you know, sometimes I'll you know I'm tempted to post something, but I'm like, well, how how effective is that going to be really, um, you know, so it's kind of like tempering the message with the medium and trying to, I don't know, figure it out. <laughs> yeah. And, and like putting yourself out there, like, as I was saying, the, like the real person that's, that you are out there is, you know, it's a pretty freaking intimidating because right. you don't, <laughs> you don't know what people's reactions are going to be. Right. Um, but I mean, so far it's been cool. I haven't gotten any death threats or anything, so that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that's a start. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People uh, allow me to live. It's yeah. pretty nice. <laughs> so let's uh, let's kind of continue this thread um, with a uh, with a uh, social media bike packing and gender and race. Um, you know, it seems I, I love your strategy of trying to get uh, Blackburn to to get all women. 
uh, make them more visible. Why do you think the, the bike industry has such a, a tough time with that? Well, I think it has to do with a like a history of of uh, male supremacy and patriarchy within the sport. Um, it has to do with you, how races are structured, how women are still not allowed. I, and I think it's it's just this like hegemonic thinking that has really set in. Um, and it's not it's through no fault of people. I don't think they're actively trying to like right. at, at this point, um, they were definitely actively suppressing women from riding bicycles <laughs> like 100 years ago. But right. um, but today, I, I don't think it's it's active. I think it is uh, like default, you right. know, uh, default systems, default modes of operation. And um, part of why I think social media is useful is because it, it animates new like pathways in your brain of thinking. And I hope that people do it enough that we start we start seeing what's possible and kind of take a look at the water that we're around and figure out, oh, shit, we're in water and we we're like trying to breathe over here. Right. So um, I, I don't I think it's just that that hegemonic makeup of the culture um, that doesn't see it. But I see a lot of people trying to change that. And I see a lot of like you know, industry people and otherwise on the small scale and the large scale trying to shift that a little bit, which is really, really cool. Um, and I think that cycling actually needs it. Right. Um, <laughs> like it, it, we, we need to be more than just like the same thing that we've been seeing. Cause that's kind of boring. Right. And yeah, I think for, for me personally, it's kind of, it's sad when I, you know, I flip through, uh, the Instagrams and, um, I'm always like, you know, scroll, scroll, scroll. And when I see someone that's, you know, not a white dude, like I stop and that's shocking to me. And it's sad that that, that it's shocking, you know? <laughs> and then you double click, you're like, 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 right, like, right, so yeah. much. <laughs> you like, make sure you know who they are. Yeah. Because I feel yeah. like in, in some ways, you know, I got into touring in, um, I don't know, 2007-ish, uh, before there was, you know, Instagram was really blown up. But I feel like if I was getting into it now and just seeing how, you know, who's doing it and how it's represented, I would be like, that's just for white people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's not for and me. That's what like, I thought for years. <laughs> yeah, I don't see myself in that, like, at all. So, yeah. And I think, like, I think the people who need it the most, I mean, like, from... I can speak from my own experiences, like, the 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 clarity, the... Um, like the clarity in not only your mind but like in how you want to build bikes or like what kind of bike you want to ride it's it's like super empowering and connects you to yourself and it gives you or it gives me like as a person with lots of um trauma in my background like it it allows me to like go through that however it comes out you know and i think that's super important for lots of people who have like traumatic histories that they're trying to deal with. And most mm -hmm. of those people tend to be like folks of color, women, trans, like people who have been the dirt kicked in their faces like the entire yeah. time. <laughs> so we see other people who are doing it and we hear stories about like, I think humans are one of the only creatures where like we need stories to like tell us who we are. Right. And <laughs> we can we can imagine these stories from, from people who look like us, you right. know, people who are poor and they're like, okay, well, if she can get a bike somehow and do this somehow, then I think that I can. And it's something I've been wanting to do for a while. And, you know, whatever it is that people go through in their brains to get them to become active. <sighs> right. I think it's like, like it's, Yeah. I think what's interesting is, um, the bike industry still views, uh, in some ways sponsorship, like an old school model. Like, you know, we have to get this professional athlete, you know, and really kind of uh, broadcast their story and that'll inspire people. But for yeah. me, for me personally, when I see that, it's like that is so like far beyond my reality that it does no inspiration for me. But when I see regular folks, people that look like me that aren't, you know, the people that you typically see on the magazines, that's like more impactful. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like it, it, it also feels like you're being lied to when it's like a big company who's like pushing this person is like oh look at this look at this person look at their story and it's like whoa am I like <laughs> am I be, being the bachelorette or something yeah. uh, and I'm not gonna get the rose at the end of the day anyway but like 
uh, it does it does feel a bit deceiving, and it social media is also great because it kind of like makes you have friends that aren't necessarily your friends, but like you're still pretty tight with them somehow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's kind of cool. It gives you that like sense of community that we don't necessarily have in our isolated pockets wherever we may be in the world. Right. You know, you're in you're in Missoula, Montana, and right. it's like how many brown people are riding bikes over there right now? So far <laughs> one. <know>? <laughs> 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 work on that one <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's funny I actually bef before moving here uh i looked at the the i think the 2016 census and i was like how many other filipinos are there in missoula i think there were 36 <laughs> so i'm like number 37 <laughs> Thir right on 37 <laughs> so do you feel um is there a certain pressure that you feel to represent just to be visible and uh, to, to get people, uh, people of color, other women uh, into bike touring, bike packing? No, I don't feel that pressure at all. Uh, <laughs> like, um, <that's> good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe if I was like younger and I thought that like, and I, I did think I could change the world or whatever, but um, at this point, I, I don't think so. Uh, I, and I particularly like don't, really feel that pressure at all because I'm just doing my own thing and uh like doing it from a place of choice on my on my own accord and something that I really like to do um so I hope that's enough uh, and I hope that translates over social media but right. <laughs> yeah yeah no no pressure but I definitely want to put the pressure on like the industry on the culture to make sure that like it's being seen but for myself, I, I don't I don't feel it. I get mad when I don't see enough brown people on bikes, or that um, that that like Ferda girls video about yeah. mountain biking. I was like, man, a bunch of white girls are gonna take <laughs> Kendrick Lamar's song. God yeah. damn it! Um, but you know, like it's uh, and I I did feel a little bit of pressure to like kind of speak out against that, but. I'm not going to shit on other women cyclists who are feeling empowered, you know, um, I'm definitely not going to shit on that. Yeah. So just yeah. like kept my mouth closed <laughs> and carried on with my day, ate my taco, <laughs> went to sleep. <laughs> what are, um, do you have any ideas of like just e easy things that bike shops or, or, um, you know, brands could do to kind of, you know, level the playing field and kind of facilitate this conversation? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think about my story and it's been about like opportunity. Um, like if I wasn't gifted my touring rig, um, I wouldn't have necessarily toured. Um, that opportunity was presented to me and I took it and I loved it. And Blackburn presented me with the opportunity to travel abroad. I haven't, I haven't really done that at all because, sure. you know, I didn't have a passport. I wasn't a citizen of the U.S., I, all this other stuff. So I think these opportunities come up and that might be different for like whatever bike shop or frame builder, like whatever your capabilities are of providing those opportunities for folks and just like trying to be a good person and realizing that people come into your shop or people come and ask you for a different frame with with a whole like personhood and not necessarily like uh, the most knowledge person about uh, bikes or frames or whatever it is. And just to like share your knowledge in a way that is like cooperative and not like paternalistic or like condescending. Right. Um, I've definitely been paternalized <laughs> at and condescended at quite a bit. And that really like drew me off of cycling initially is like being 18 and going to a bike shop and being like, hey, can you turn this into a fixie? And they're like, no, that's right. stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, oh, OK. Um, so then you don't engage when you have these negative interactions with an industry or people. Um, you don't engage. You don't want to. It's like a it's like a self-preserving thing that we've learned as humans. And that's totally legit. So like, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not asking for too much here just right. for people to be good. <laughs> <laughs> just be good people yeah and you know like to provide those opportunities and when you see somebody who's kind of not the average uh cyclist to to make sure you're giving like extra care and attention um and 
you know, like doing everything you can to make sure their experience is good. Mm -hmm. We people know how to do that. We live in like this hyper service <laughs> in based industry, you know, right. like it, it should be like that. And I don't think it's too much to ask. Yeah, to be I honest. Think, yeah, I think it's kind of like interesting times in the bike industry. It doesn't sound like it's doing very well. Lots of shops are closing. And uh, part of that, I think, is like the value proposition for the bike shop has to change. They're not just a uh, purveyor of goods, but they have to be like a third space, a community space, a place that, you know, enables, you know, new cyclists. Uh, so there is like a huge like service and an educational component that bike shops have to embrace. And then, yeah. You know, so far, I've seen like the ones that are like, we only sell stuff are like not doing well. And the ones that are kind of nurturing community are doing better. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because like you can, there is like uh there was, I think, Bicycle Times or Bicycling did an article on, like, how to make Amazon your bike shop, right. which, <laughs> like, which pissed off so many people, and rightfully so, because it's like, if you don't have that relationship with somebody, you could be ordering the wrong size headset until the day you die and still not have a finished bike, you know, and right. you bring it to a bike shop that you know that you're, like, friends with, and they're like, oh, yeah, we got that, and it's three seconds, you right. have a bike, so I think it's really helpful to have these relationships, like you were saying, and like a sense of community around a bike shop. And I think bike shops are incredible for building that sense of community um, and fun, like centered around being active and being outside and fun and creating your own aesthetic for a bike. Like that, all that stuff is so fun to me. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that bike shops have nurtured and i hope will continue to nurture i hope people don't just order their shit on amazon you know <laughs> yeah um because you don't know what it's gonna look like on your bike you don't know how it's gonna feel you you know like all this stuff yeah all this stuff bicycling is very emotional so like you gotta be connected emotionally to it yeah, otherwise have, like what be, the fuck are you doing yeah they have to be part therapist like I, I yeah definitely think... <laughs> <laughs> totally <laughs> I, mean, I definitely feel like you know because of the internet um, you know, there's price transparency. So if someone's just trying to shop on, I just want the cheapest deal, you know, bike shop's going to lose. So they've got to have another like value proposition and whether that's service or just warm and fuzzy from being like, you know, a good shop people like that's something that they have to like really promote and focus on. Yeah. Know? So do you have, totally. So, so speaking of that, do you have any, what's been a, a couple of your favorite bike shops that you've, you've visited? Um, I love Golden Saddle, of course, in LA. Um, those dudes are like so freaking nice and welcoming. And when I'm imagining like bike shops in terms of what they can be and what they can provide for the community, like I'm thinking about Golden Saddle. Right. Um, there's just people chilling like in in their like uh, hallway kind of thing <laughs> outside and. Like there's so many beautiful things to look at, but there's also like a full scale bike shop and the people who come in there are just like really friendly. It does feel like there's a sense of community there. Um, that's the only like bike shop outside of and in Tucson. There's so many like there's a bikeist, which is called which is like a nonprofit, but mm -hmm. they get donated bicycles and then they like strip the parts and offer services and um, skills to the community um, on the cheap. Like they do such such good work, and they're they've they're like a pillar of the community here in Tucson. Um, so, like I can't I can't even I couldn't even imagine <laughs> something as wonderful as Bikus, like, yeah. you know, that exists outside of this. Um, there's another bike shop in Tucson. There's so many good ones in Tucson. Have you, have you been to um, Transit yet? Yes. Yeah, yeah I was going to mention Transit, of course, with Duncan, who is incredible and such a champion of like everything I believe in. Um, my friend Mo works there, too. She's like a lady mechanic, um, which is really, really awesome to see. Like, I almost never expect <laughs> there to be like a woman mechanic. And you walk into transit and there's Mo and there's like Duncan, who's like a brown man. <laughs> you right, know, yeah. it's, it's like, <laughs> wow, what's going on at this shop? Right. You know, that's very different than anything else I've ever seen. So transit is like amazing too. Um, there's also a blue dog that just opened up, which has got a really nice, like easy vibe. Um, yeah, lots of really amazing bike shops and people who work within bike shops like bikus also has a 
Women Trans Femme Night, which I'd never even seen before. Like, Bikus is the first place I learned about WTF, like, Women Trans Femme, like, that people were actually using those letters um, to represent an entire group of people. And I was like, hell yeah, like, yeah. that's that was, that, that was a seed that was planted. And so, yeah, there's a... There's a lot of there's a lot of love <laughs> for bike shops yeah. um, around here and otherwise. Yeah. Well, let's talk about WTF uh, for a second. We uh, chatted with Sarah and she had mentioned uh, the D WTF Bike Explorer Summit that that uh, you're a part of as well. I heard. Yeah. 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 That's gonna. Be I jumped on um, like about a week ago or two weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. So what's kind of the, the the plan and vision for that? Do you have a plan? Um, yeah, first of its kind, um, and it's all women organizing it, uh, women and, like, non-binary folks organizing it, which is really, really cool. Um, it's going to be, like, clinics and workshops during the, the longish weekend. It's going to be from August 16th to the 19th in, in Montana at the Whitefish Bike Retreat, um, and we're imagining like people kind of descending on there, like with little <laughs> mini bike tours to to bike fish or like um, uh, like the way Swift Industry does their um, the camp out, the camp outs. Like that would be cool to have ice, people who can't make it would run their own like regional version of it. Um, and I think just like people coming together who have had these identities or had beef with the cycling industry because they weren't represented or like they do the shrink it and pink it thing. Someone wrote, mm -hmm. I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> um, like, I think that just being around other people and like there's lots of activities happening, but I think the, the thing that's really magical to me is just getting these folks that I know I'm going to love <laughs> like together in one place doing something that we all really like to do. Um, and the future, I'm not, I'm not really sure, but for me, like the future of whatever WTF, um, bike summit is, is going to be dependent on the participants and like what we want. I think that's, that's a really cool feeling <laughs> to like have an assembly of the Thundercats from <laughs> everywhere. <Nice>. <laughs> <laughs> Deep down Skeletor or whatever. Um, <laughs> d different show. Yeah. Um, Voltron. <laughs> it's like when the, the lions come together. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I think just like the gathering is, is pretty good. Um, why, do you, why do you think it's important to create that, that safe space? Um, I'm not sure how safe this space is going to be. Uh, I've tried to create lots of safe spaces that are definitely not safe <laughs> yeah. uh, for lots of people because it's like everyone comes in with different experiences right. and might not necessarily like there's for, for lots of people, there's no such thing as safe space. Right. Um, but to have a gathering of people where their like intention is to make sure that everyone is feeling OK. And right. um, why do I think that's important? so many reasons um i guess like, like it doesn't exist right. you know because it doesn't it doesn't exist right now and uh i am a big proponent of like having people who have been invisible uh visibilized and empowered um because i think it changes the entire like narrative and power structure of how the world works mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a really <laughs> big picture but um yeah, I think it's important for people to be, to feel seen and to, to feel heard and to have a sense of community so they're not feeling like they're alone. Um, because like right now, we isolate more and more. Um, and it's because the world is an unsafe place for lots and lots of people, um, especially women. Like we can barely walk down the street without getting our safety compromised. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really important for us to all come together and to understand that that, you, that we're not alone in this and that we're not crazy and we're not we're not going to let ourselves be gaslighted or, you know, whatever it is, that there is an actual reason for us to be together. Right. Um, um, yeah, I mean, it, it moves me to tears a lot of the times, my sensitive ass, like it's, it's, a uh, yeah, I have, I have big hopes for this, obviously. Cool. <laughs> We're going to get yeah. together and patriarchy is going to be over <laughs> by the time September comes. <laughs> it's going to be done. 
<laughs> have you have you been to the whitefish bike retreat before i've never been i've never been to montana no uh but i got a hitchhiking ride with a trucker once and he said that montana was the most beautiful place on the planet that he's ever been to and that i should definitely go <laughs> yeah well kind you, truckers yeah love montana <laughs> although the bike retreat uh whitefish bike retreat you i think you'll enjoy it it's a super cool space uh cricket the owner is like super rad um definitely like someplace special so cool that's what i hear yeah that's what i hear and it like i think place is also really really important too you know like a, a sense of place as displaced people like i'm sure you yeah. can kind of understand yeah. what i mean by that <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, well, let's. Uh, there's one more topic that I want to uh, touch on before we wrap up, and it's this kind of like recurring question I'm asking all our or most of the guests is this idea of behind the hashtag. You know, like especially like now uh, with social media, um, and <clears throat> sometimes we feel like compelled to portray a certain image, or sometimes people assume like a certain lifestyle by the imagery we portray. Um, you know, is it all like bike rides and puppies and rainbows or, you know, what's the, what's, what's, what are the challenges of, of living like the biking semi-nomadic lifestyle? <laughs> yeah. Um, butt sweat is a big one. <laughs> <laughs> you know about that butt yeah. sweat life. Um, like you're playing with puppies and like dealing with that perpetual swamp ass. Um, <laughs> Uh, like safety is a big one because uh, most of the times we're wild camping and it's like uh, just the stress of finding a place that's secluded enough but also like a place that you want to call home for the night yeah that, that always gives me a little anxiety um what are some other little things that like making sure there's like there's always that that juggle of uh shit, I don't have enough water and food, but my bike is so light right now. <laughs> and then like, and, and you're kind of like marching to, to heavy ass bike. Right. And so then there's, there's that, like the heavy bike days, um, going uphill and downhill. And, um, aside from the butt sweat stuff, uh, and just kind of like rolling into town, the thing that, uh, that always gets me or I think it's kind of funny is like rolling into a town or like a really nice place looking like total trash bags. <laughs> <laughs> like you look so bad. You probably smell bad too a little bit. Yeah. And you're with really nice people, but it's like it, that, that always gets me. And I think that's also kind of fun because you get to challenge people's perceptions of like what's socially acceptable in a certain situation and then you destroy it. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, that stuff is really cool. Um, I can't necessarily think of any like dark sides of bike touring because they're such fleeting moments. Like, um, cause overall what I remember is like the puppies and the rainbows and the joy. Um, I also have a really amazing travel partner, like, and mm -hmm. everyone I've been on bike tour with has been the coolest people on the planet. Um, really like, Sarah is one of them. I totally mm -hmm. fell in love with Sarah and like the DFL crew from Baja were also awesome. So it's like I'm I'm learning that when you travel with people and like in your bike touring with people, it, it really makes the whole experience more fun and you laugh about the butt sweat and then you stick your ass in the fire to like dry it out as a group it's really nice instead of just pathetically doing it with like your partner whose butt and balls you've seen over and over and over again like I'm, I'd be like eating something and I turn around and I'm like okay <laughs> there it is <laughs> there it is um I have found that baby powder like I, I've started carrying baby powder <laughs> Real talk. <laughs> I don't do that. No? I don't do baby powder. Damn. <laughs> it just drives things out and, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's, it sounds like you're in Tucson. Is this like quasi permanent or are you just, just kind of base camping there for a while or what? Yeah. What's yeah. Here for a little while. Um, it's definitely been a nice refuge away from the cold and the harshness of New England. Um, which I'm so used to it actually still feels a little weird that it's December and it kind of feels like this, but, um, yeah, like 
for all the reasons listed before, I, I love Tucson. There's a really healthy bike community here. Like there's transit with Duncan and Mo and our other roommate Colin is at Bikus. I feel like I can do anything. Like I already went on, on incredible rides. Like within the first week I got here, um, there's just a really nice, supportive, nurturing community. And I can build whatever bike I want here because <laughs> there's so many resources for people who um, who are, like, new to bike building and, right. but still really want to learn about this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Sweet. Uh, well, thank you so much for uh, being a, a guest on our YouTube channel. And uh, if you guys enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe and like. And if you have suggestions for future guests, leave those in the comments below. And thank you once again, Nam. Um, uh, enjoy your time in Tucson. Thanks, Russ. Yeah, it nice was a chatting. pleasure. Yeah, so good.